All right. Uh, last time we reviewed the um, validation controls and we reviewed sort of the, the flow of the, the form process, how the form gets displayed, the form controls are displayed, the user fills those in, and then it gets sent, like if we click on a button or something, we get sent to the server. I think it's really important to understand how that works because um, it's important to understand when code fires off. And the code that we're putting in the code behind file is server-side code. As such, it doesn't get fired off until you go back to the server. And what makes you go back to the server? Well, a couple things do. One of them is the, the, the most obvious one, the one that we've been using so far, is clicking a button. So clicking a button sends you back to the server. Then your code's going to run to do this, that, or the other. All right. Otherwise, if you're just if you're just navigating through a form and entering data into a form, you're not necessarily going to be uh, executing any of your server-side code because it's not going back to the server. So it's always important to understand how that um, interaction works. How the the form is loaded initially, the user fills in the data, press submit, goes back to the server. Those controls maintain their state, that is, they remember what values they had, and then your code behind can do some sort of manipulations based on that. So what we're going to do today, and we looked at validation, and we looked at a number of things. What I want to do today is I want to do a little example uh, in, in class, and depending on how it goes, the, the second half of class might be an exercise today. All right. First of all, how many of you in here have had C Sharp? Okay. Is that, uh, is that around half of you, it, it looked like? All right, so, so let's see. How many people are here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, about 13. And how many of you had C Sharp? Nine. So about nine out, or ten out of 13. Okay. All right, so a little more than half. All right. Um, let me describe the problem that I want to solve today, and then we'll, we'll go from there, and we'll see how this goes. All right. I want to create a form that looks like this. Form that contains a text box, a drop down, another text box, and a label. All right. And I want to do just some basic math. This would be like a little little math drill um, for uh, for students. Actually, let's change this a little bit. Um, Let's put in let's put in a text box here. Then let's put a label somewhere. So what the user can do is the user can sorry, type in the text box, a number, an operation, which will be add, subtract, multiply, divide, and another number. And they can put their answer. And when they press the button, which I forgot the list here, it'll tell them if they're right or not. All right. So a little drill program where students can play around entering math problems and checking to see if they, they have them right or not. And we can expand this if we want to 
want to, and maybe we will, to make it where the, the page generates a problem randomly. But we'll, we'll start with this first. All right. So, obviously we're going to need some validation on here as well, because we don't want the program blowing up if some, someone gets the bright idea to try to, you know, enter in letters or nonsense characters. So we're going to make sure that each of these fields gets entered and each of these fields have a number in them. So we're going to validate those fields. All right. So let's go and start building this. Keep in mind in this example, I'm not going to be terribly concerned about the look of it. Uh, if this were an actual assignment, I would spend some time to get it to look complete and all that. All right. Typically with this, my first step is to design and set up the GUI. Then I can work on the code behind and then I can do some testing and make sure that it's correct. One thing that I think it's important for me to stress in all my classes is the need for good and comprehensive testing. Uh, a lot of software developers, in my mind, are weak on testing. And I'm not just talking about students, I'm talking about in uh, a professional context as well. All right. Um, and again, why is that? Well, we could point to a lot of reasons for it. Uh, but the main reason, I think, is because typically a systematic approach isn't taken to testing. All right. Um, you know, I, I may start to sound like a robot at some point in this class, talking about a systematic approach for design, a systematic approach for debugging, a systematic approach for testing. But, you know, that's the kind of line of work we're in, right? I mean, we shouldn't be, you know, shooting from the hip and like, oh, I tested it a few times, it seemed to work. No, we should have a good, solid plan of how we're going to test it. We'll talk a little bit about a test plan when when I, I finish it out. And if it doesn't work, we should have a systematic way of attacking the problem so that we can find them. All right? We don't want to be shooting in the dark and happen to hit on a solution. All right? um, that, that, that's such a waste of time. If you take a systematic approach, you know, it may, see, it may seem longer than just like randomly trying things, but ultimately you know, you, you'll, you'll be able to, to uh, debug your code more efficiently. At any rate, let's go in and let's create our That gives me a headache, I think. <laughs> All right. So I'll go file new website and ASP.NET empty website C sharp that's good I will create on the desktop a folder called I don't know math drill And I'll go and create it. Sure enough, we get our folder that contains our web config file. All right. If we look, we can see the folder that contains that. I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a new file called a web form. I'll call it default ASPX. Place code in separate file? Yes. Vis Visual C sharp? Yes. Select master page? Not yet. We're not, we're not ready to do that quite yet. So I'll click add and I get my blank page. All right. Now, I can go in and I can 
start adding in the controls. And again, I can do this either in the, the code view, source view, or design view. It doesn't really matter. If I remember right, I said I needed a text box. A drop down list. Another text box. A label. I need another text box. And then a label, I think. And I need a button. Now, it's a good idea to go in and change the IDs to something that makes sense. All right? Text box one, text box two, text box three. You know, when you're working on this and you come back to it, you know, do you want to have to sit and think about like what what's what's in text box three again? Is that so? It's a good idea to to give them meaningful names as you're doing that. So, I will change the ID of this guy to txt operator one or uh, operand one. DD operator TXT operator two TXT answer label answer and BTN submit. Now, I like to prefix my controls with a little indication of what kind of control it is. So that I see the TXT opera and I know that that's a text box. I don't have to do that, but it helps me keep, keep straight. Yes? Does it matter whether you start out like text with a capital T or a small t? Is there some format that should be followed? I typically use the format of the first word is lowercase and each subsequent word is uppercase for like names of things. Functions I guess are, are the exception where every word is capitalized. Um, it does matter uh, and really in my opinion it matters less what you do um, than that you do it consistently. So in other words if you're going to do lowercase like I did for the first word then, then continue to do that throughout throughout this. Yes? Save you some headaches later. You got label A-M-S-W-E-R. Now how did you know I didn't do that on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, we can look at this in design view. And there we go, which kind of looks like what we had up there. A couple things to keep in mind. First of all, you know, I went in and just typed in the ID. You can do this a bunch of different ways, right? If you have this clicked, if you notice over here is all the properties for that. So I could go and set the properties in the properties window. And as I change it, there it changes it in the code. So it's the same property, I guess is what I'm saying. Whether I access it by typing in the code or whether I go to the properties window. And in fact, these are the same properties that we are going to programmatically set or programmatically look at and, and get the values. I guess we could programmatically set them. But in this case, we're going to get some values uh, from it. Yes? In the design view, can you resize and, and pull them around and that kind of stuff like you can in C-sharp? Um, so well, that's a great question. Are there any other questions? No. <laughs> uh, that's a great question.
question. Um, keep in mind that you probably want to do the, the danger in doing that is that you're going to have a lot of embedded style kind of stuff in if you do that. And that's generally not good for maintainability. So any of the, typically speaking, I don't do any like dragging around or if I do all the layout via CSS. So that's why since this isn't a class in CSS, I'm not going to go and design this any further. But if I was going to do it, I'd do it via CSS. The one thing about, uh, again, the one thing about this is, is that the tool sometimes leads you down a path of least resistance, and that's not always the best, best place to go. In the properties window, there's a way to group your categories. I haven't looked into it yet, but I'm hoping there's one that groups all the visual stuff, like somewhere away from all the rest of the stuff. I'm not following what you're saying. You can, all those properties, uh -huh. there's a button up above there where you can them differently, like oh, okay. Or I think it's like the first or second. Right. Category. Categorized. Right. Yeah. Appearance. Yeah. So I yeah. I'll move it that way and then just collapse the appearance so I don't touch those. Yeah. It keeps you from. Good stuff. Good strategy. Yeah. I'll buy that. Either that or alphabetical. You know, whatever works for you. But yeah, you're right. If you're if you're concerned about like not wanting to use those appearance properties, yeah, then, then go in and do it that way. All right, let's put some validators on here. All right, so I'm actually going to need to put in two validators for each thing, right? Why do I need two validators for each thing? One to make sure something's entered. Mm -hmm. Right, and specifically in this case, a number. a number. So I need a validator to make sure something is entered, and I need a validator entered to make sure that it's a number. And again, you know, if anyone in this class complains about having to put two validator controls for this, I'll go on and explain back how when I was a kid, we had to write all our own JavaScript <laughs> ourselves. And there wasn't even computers then, so we couldn't even test it. So we had to wait till computers were invented and, and then test it. So it, it does lend itself to more flexibility, right? Because you could have a field that was optional, all right? You could have a field that was optional, but if you entered it, it did have to fit a certain format. Again, like age. You could have a, for, a field on a form for age. that They didn't have to enter it, but if they did enter it, it has to be a number. So by doing the way they've done with a couple of validators, that sort of guarantees that. So I'm going to go in and put in a required field validator to make sure that there's a field entered, and a compare validator. for each of these things. Now, what do we have to set for a compare validator, what, or I'm sorry, what do we have to set for a required field validator? What are the, some of the, the attributes of a required field validator that we're going to want to set? It should not be empty. Pardon me? It should not be empty. The, the required field validator is going to guarantee that it's not empty. Right. So what attributes on this required field validator control do we want to set to make sure, for example, that the first number isn't empty? You have to tie it to that yeah, first input. Right. We have to tie it to the control that we're validating. What else do we probably want to set? 
the message, because right now the message simply says required field validator. And we'll say must enter a number. Must enter an operand, we'll say. What other attributes have we seen for this guy that we would want to do? The display, do we want to make it dynamic? Probably want to make the display dynamic. And what that will do is if the no validation error occurs, then it will not take up any space. So that way, we get the errors to line up correctly. Yes? I'm sorry, what was the one before display validator? Or display dynamic? The error message. Error. Mm -hmm. And what was the one before the error message? Yeah. Control to validate. Control to validate, then error message. Then display dynamic. We probably also want to change the ID on this to be something more meaningful. All right. I'll go and do this for the other two. Validators. I'm being very careful on this one to dot the I's and cross the T's as they say. Sloppy with later examples, I can say. When you want a TXT operand You are absolutely correct. And then finally, required field validator. says I want to allow to debug this. And I 
can't recall if we get the error immediately or if we get it after we try to validate, we get it. Ah, I need to fill in those other validators. Oh boy, not my day. All right, let's go in here. Compare validator. Control to validate. TXT operand one. Data type check. Type double. All right. Everyone, see what I'm doing here with the compare validator. We have we compare. Uh, we we can use it to compare two different fields on the on the screen. We can also use it to compare and do a data type check. So I simply associated this control with, or this validator with that control, the text box one. I set my error message. I said I want to do a data type check, and I specified that the type that I'm doing a data type check up against is a double. And I need to do that for the other two. Does everyone get the error that I got originally? This is different than the, the, the error that was mentioned about the web config file. But when I run this, I get an error. And what this is telling me is that I have a validator that isn't associated. <laughs> now I get that error. Uh, what the previous error told me is I got an error that was not associated with the um, with the um, a control to validate. So I'll go in here, must enter a number, control to validate, txt operand 2, operator data type, and type of double. Pair validator three. Control to validate. Answer. <clears throat> data type check. And lastly, that it is a double. All right. So now I should have my, all my validator controls set, but I'm still going to get that error, which is because we need to put that app setting uh, value in it. All right. Again, how did I troubleshoot that? I just went and Googled that. All right. And if you do that, you'll find the error, and you'll find the fix for the error. And I put that fix in the example for last week. So I'm going to download that and just copy that line of code. Go in and copy these app settings and put it into my web config file. All right. Now we go to run it and it should run. 